Thank you very much, Ajahn Giet, for a kind introduction. And good morning, participants and distinguished guests. It's my honor today to present on the topic of eliminate vertical HIV transmission. Is it achievable in Asia? So you might wonder why we have this topic. Because we know since 1994 that ACT given to pregnant women can reduce vertical transmission to baby. We know that other parts of the world, in developed world, US or UK, the overall transmission rate is only less than 0.5%. So I think that the elimination of vertical HIV transmission in Asia is definitely achievable. But just when and how fast we can go to that point. So this is the global policy in 2009. Ban Ki-moon, UN Secretary General, has a flank statement and the direction that no child should be born with HIV. No child should be orphaned because of HIV. And no child should die due to lack of access to treatment. And this set a stage that prevention of vertical transmission need to be integrated to many programs, and that is a challenge. The first thing it has to be integrated to mother to child services to make sure that every infant's access to it. Secondly, it had to integrate it with HIV adult services to make sure that their parents get lifelong treatment. And also integrate it with early infant diagnosis and pediatric ARV to make sure that the poor child who was infected access to treatment. And where are we? What is the definition of elimination? According to this topic, I would like to refer to elimination criteria from the WHO, the elimination criteria from HIV as a significant public health. So if we talk about elimination as clinician, we would talk as 0% transmission, but this is the public health program overall. There are two criteria. The first one is HIV impact indicators, meaning that mother to child transmission rate need to be below 5% in breastfeeding populations or less than 2% in non-breastfeeding population, which is um, mostly applied to the Asia countries. And the second, have to have process indicators, meaning that more than 95% of pregnant women need to access to at least one antenatal care services. More than 95% need to be HIV testing. And more than 90% access to antiretroviral drug coverage during pregnancy. Back in year 2000, half a million infants born HIV positive. And we say that we cannot tolerate this number. We would like to reduce this number below 90%. In 2015, still 150,000 babies born infected with HIV. So we are in the right direction, but it's not fast enough. And there are another campaign saying that start and stay AIDS free generation. They urge that we should work together to have new HIV infections below 20,000 by 2020. And this busy slide shows the overall picture globally. The graph is distributed by region. The left-hand side is South Africa. In the middle is East Asia and Pacific, and South Asia, Latin America, and this is 21 PMTCT high priority countries. And out of 150,000 babies, majority, 80% is occurring in Africa or Latin America, but 20,000 infants still born in this region. And you can see strikingly that in the past five years, they are significantly improved in reduction in all region except where are we in Asia. And where are these poor children are? This slide is summaries of the map of the landscape of the situation in Asia. This graph shows the access to ART in pregnant women, and this graph shows the HIV transmission rate in baby. So the left-hand side, the darker the color, it means that it's higher access. And HIV transmission, the lighter the color, it means that lower transmission. So we start with the access to treatment. You can see that it's high heterogeneity, it's difference between countries. It's ranged from less than 40% in India, in Indonesia, and up to around 70% in Vietnam, 80% in Myanmar, and more than 95% in Thailand. And this reflects directly to HIV transmission rate. In Indonesia, it's still higher than 30%. In Myanmar, 15%. In Cambodia, 6%. And in Thailand, it's 1.9%. 
so how we can overcome these challenges and meet to our goal. I would like to address five challenges. The first one, which is very important, is stigma. I talked to the parents and he said, she said that when you talk about mother to child transmission program, you already put the stigma on the mother, put the burden on the woman, that she is the one who get transmission to the baby. And no mother in the world would like the baby to get sick or infected. And they proposed that it should be changed to parent to child transmission because fathers sometimes bring infection to mother and mother to infants. And we need more engagement of male partners in this effort because we need male to get involvement, to need male to support women and pregnant women to get into the cascade to get treatment and not just run away when they know that they have HIV positive during pregnancy, which is the time that should be a happy time, but they get the, the bad news and don't know what to do. And the second challenge is the program has been harmonized with HIV adult care. You might wonder why this is a challenge. One of the challenges is that because it's integrated to the benefit of mother to have lifelong treatment is a great thing. It's integrated that 90% of pregnant women or HIV adults need to know the HIV status. 90% receive ART. But the problem is on the 90% achieve viral suppression. Because in chronic HIV adults, you can wait six months to be undetectable is the aim. But for pregnant women, it's not the case. We need viral load suppressed at time of delivery. And many people in this room know that we don't have six months to work in pregnant women. Most of the time we diagnose them at second trimester. And in many countries they're still diagnosed at delivery. So we need time and we need a special program for pregnant women. Not just because I'm a woman, I have baby. No, because we need specific treatment for both mother and also to prevent baby. And the third challenge is come to the first 90 of the cascade. HIV screening at antenatal clinic. It's quite simple, but actually in Asia with the low prevalence countries, in some countries prevalence is less than 0.1%, but when we calculate it with the populace, population like in China, more than 1 billion people, even though they are 0.1 prevalence, we still need to screen everyone. In the past they used targeted testing, which is failed, because it's stigma patient who was asked to be tested. And because if they're pregnant, it automatically means that, that couples have unprotected sex, not use condom, that's why they're pregnant. So it, it's already irritable that parents, both father and mother, need universal testing. And this is not just for baby, this is the entry point of test and treat, it's the entry point of get to ends epidemic. If we can see this as an um, entry point to access to get testing for reproductive health, male and female, we need to encourage more universal testing in many countries. The second one is on couple HIV testing and counseling. What does it mean? It means that the couples should get testing together, get counseling together and get mutual disclosure of status in order to access prevention and treatment service together. In the past what we do is that if we find HIV positive pregnant women, we will call their partner to get tested. This is not couple counseling, this is called partner testing. Because you, you, can, you cannot identify zero discordant male positive and female negative because you start off from female positive. We need couple HIV testing counseling to reduce stigma for pregnant women and also to identify zero conversion risk in zero discordant male positive, female negative. And this is a figure of HIV testing coverage. In countries, the countries like Indonesia or India, which have many populations, in Indonesia, estimated HIV positive pregnant women is 16,000 per year, but HIV testing coverage is only 25%, and transmission rate still 30%. In India, estimated HIV positive pregnant women is 35,000, which is almost 10 times of Thailand, and HIV testing coverage is only 57%. So this is the first challenge that we need to overcome in order to get the entry point for women to get access to prevention services. And the next one is on challenge on the ARV. Giving antiretroviral drugs for pregnant women, there are three things to think about. The first thing is when to start. Second, whether we can have viral suppression at time of delivery. And the third one, what regimen that is safe for both pregnant women and also the infants. 
So the first one went to start the data from UK and French cohort showing clearly that if you start ART after third trimester, the transmission risk is not, can be less than 2%. And whether we can achieve viral suppression, we need to make sure that programmatic level and also individual level, she had viral suppression at time delivery. Why is that so important? Because we know that the HIV risk of transmission is strongly related to HIV viral load near delivery. If the viral load of mother is more than 10,000, the risk is up to 10%. But if you can bring down one log to less than 1,000 copies, can bring down to 2.5%. And even almost neglectable risk if mother have viral suppression less than 50 copies. And a study from Europe showing that if mother have HIV treatment before conception and have viral load suppression all the time of pregnancy, there's zero transmission. So we know that it can be, be do sciencely. It's not rocket science, but just how to make it deliver to the patients in need. And this slide is summary of the antiretroviral drug recommended in pregnancy. There are some difference between guideline, US, WHO, and Thai guideline. So in the past, we used ACT, 3TC as a backbone. But because of the limitation of twice daily, the risk of anemia, and also the recommended first line for adult is already changed to tenofovir. So now in pregnancy, we also recommend tenofovir 3TC. And the third drug in US recommended boosted once daily PI, atazanavir, and darunavir, or integrase inhibitor rauticavir. But the WHO recommend efferens. And the only guideline that recommended regimen built in the time of starting ART is the British guideline. If pregnant women start ART in third trimester and viral load more than 100,000 copies, or you don't know viral load, they recommend three to four drug regimen includes reticovir. And why we need to talk about reticovir? Because the integrase inhibitors class has a special property of rapid viral decay that is appropriate for pregnant women that we have limited time to work with to bring her into undetectable viral load. And Roticovir is the only drug in class that was approved to use in pregnancy and also have clinical data. Dolotecrovir and Elvitecrovir start to have pharmacokinetics data presented at CROI, but it still need more times of what is the, um, to be approved and also have more experience in pregnancy. So in this graph is the graph from HIV naive adult and they try to demonstrate how is the viral decay comparing to regimen. The red line represented Rauticovir, and the blue line is efferens or boosted PI. And you can see that within one week of treatment, you can reduce at least one log of viral load. And within four weeks, 50% of the patients had viral load undetectable, which none in efferens or boosted PI. So it's perfect for pregnant women who are presenting late or the one who still have high viral load near delivery. And this review article showing that in 26 studies all over the globe, more, mostly in developed country, that they use reticular in pregnancy in different trimester. And they show that the median time to achieve viral load less than 1,000 copies, remember that if you can bring down to less than 1,000 copies, the transmission rate will be around 2.5%, which we would like to see. It's only eight days. And in the whole review, there are only two infected infants, one in, in utero infection and one peripartum. And the adverse events that might occur to mother is transient transaminitis. And how about adverse outcome when we talk about ART? Are there any problems to babies? And this is the recently published from the PROMISE study conducted in Africa in pregnant women with high CD4. CD4 more than 350 cells. And then they compare ACT plus single dose nevirapine with triple therapy. Triple therapy that they use in this study is ACT, 3TC, lopinavir, or tenofovir, 3TC, lopinavir. And you can see that um, this is the HIV transmission rate at one week or otherwise in utero transmission. If you use ACT plus single dose nevirapine, the transmission rate is 1.8%. And if you triple therapy, is 0.5%. So there are benefits from reduction in transmission. But for adverse infant outcomes, they show that the patients who receive tenofovir, 3TC, lopinavir, which is not the recommended regimen in 
in the previous slide. They are at risk of more preterm delivery, very preterm, less than 32 weeks, and related to early infant death. And they have a caution that protease inhibitors with tenophobia, which might increase the level of protease inhibitors, can reduce progesterone production, and it's might related to preterm delivery. So what is the safety of using tenophobia? They are a little bit concerned that in the past we all used ACT, but now they are um, review article by Lynn Morfinson showing that tenophobia used in pregnancy and also breastfeeding, in HIV and also in hepatitis B. There are no significant increase in adverse event to babies and also mother. So it's reassuring that all guidelines change to tenophobia 3TC and it's um, no increased risk to babies. And the second one is what is the risk of prematurity and low birth weight per 1,000 women? There are some risk of prematurity and low birth weight, around 200 per 1,000 women. And there are some risk of stillbirth and congenital anomalies. But overall, when you weigh benefit of prevention and the risk of adverse event, it's better to give heart. And what is the neonatal prophylaxis regimen? We know that we give antiretroviral drug for mother to reduce viral load, but we also give post-exposure prophylaxis to neonate. And the standard is that if mother has HIV viral load undetectable, the baby just need ACT for four weeks, don't need to extend to six weeks because it's increased risk of anemia without adding any benefit. But if mother doesn't receive antiretroviral drugs or have, still have high viral load, we need combination of neonatal prophylaxis regimen. The same that we give occupational PEP or non-occupational PEP to adult that we give three drugs. However, in infants, we need to be careful on the dosage and also the side effect that might occur to newborn. So there are two type of combination that we use in the field. The first one is referred to HPTN 004 using ACT six weeks plus three doses of nevirapine in the first week. And it's shown that the transmission rate is 2.2% if received combination prophylaxis, comparing to 4.9% if used ACT alone. And also, more and more countries start to use triple combination regimen, ACT, 3TC, nevirapine for six weeks. But the dosage is still ongoing to optimize what is recommended dose. And they are a little bit concerned about risk of anemia, and it's showing from Canadian cohort that the patients who receive six weeks ART have a slightly lower hemoglobin comparing to ACT alone. In Thailand, we also use this regimen in high-risk baby, and we show that grade three or four anemia, hemoglobin less than 8%, they are not different between using triple drugs or ACT alone. So, this is the most important slide in my talk. This, I would like to propose that service delivery of vertical transmission is not just you have HIV testing or you just have heart available. It's not that simple. We need to test HIV in the first ANC, and if they are detected positive, we give ART. But at 34 to 36 weeks, we need HIV viral load testing. This is not to check whether it's work in mother, but just to check whether how we're going to manage the rest of the cascade for that baby. If mother already have heart since first trimester, have undetectable viral load, we call this as a standard risk. The baby can normal delivery. There are no point to do cesarean section. The baby just receives the sedalvadine for four weeks. But if they are high risk, they still have high viral load. We need intensification of ART, we need to talk more why they not adhere to treatment, or we might consider to add roticovir into the regimen. If possible, we would like to do elective cesarean section if the viral load above 1,000 copies. And the baby also need combination regimen that already proved that is reduced reduction comparing to sedalvadi. So it's a complicated thing, but it's worth to protect baby. And the last challenge that I would like to address is incident case during pregnancy. Pregnancy itself increased risk of HIV transmission because it's change in hormone and also immunity. And the risk of transmission is much higher in acute infection during pregnancy and postpartum. And we need to diagnose by repeat HIV testing again at third trimester 
before delivery and then before we know that the, uh, the parents can give breastfeeding safely and also need to know HIV status from partner. In this area, the PrEP in pregnant women and postpartum women is quite new in Asia, but it started to use in Africa. And the definition for PrEP is that if incidence is more than three per hundred person year, it's considered as a high risk. And in this study showing that in zero discordant couple, even though the HIV positive partner start ART, they still be able to detect HIV virus in endocervical fluid or seminal fluid. And the risk of transmission is still almost the same as before start ART. We need to wait until six months of ART before the risk of transmission between partners is reduced. And there are also demonstration projects in Kenya in zero discord land that if positive partner received ART and neg zero negative partner received PrEP, the overall incident is 0.2 per 100 person year comparing to historical control of five. And the second one is they use a risk scores for incident HIV in Africa. If they are unknown partner HIV status, they get score of six. If they have syphilis, get another five and add uh, per number of partner. And if they have score more than six, the HIV incident is 7.3 per 100 person year, which is eligible to receive PrEP. So I think this area we need to discuss more in Asia that how we can prevent incident case during pregnancy and postpartum. And the the last part of my talk, I would like to share experience from Thailand, which is the first country in Asia who achieved elimination of HIV vertical transmission. And this is the effort that worked in the past two decades. And the first program that provides sedovidine to women in this country is from Thai Red Cross AIDS Research Center, led by Dr. Prapan and under patronage of Her Royal Highness Princess Som Savali Fund that provide sedovodine just two years after the announce of ACTG 076. In 2004, we provide heart to patients. And also last year, we also provide intensification heart for high-risk women. And this is the all effort from the every single hospital in Thailand that we implement the program. And in 1998, we start to use ACT in pregnant women. In 2010, we use option B, give heart to all pregnancy and gradually the HIV transmission rate is below 2%. And we pass all the process indicator. More than 98% coverage of ANC, 100% access to HIV testing in mother, but not with father, just mother. And ART coverage in pregnant women is 95%. And we, Department of Health had led a program continue monitoring and evaluation to feedback and improve the national program. And this shows the sub-national data that this is a map of Thailand. They map the area that still have high transmission rate and focus on that area. And we also do um, case investigation among new cases to find out why they're still infected. And the first three reasons is that late presenter, poor adherence or, or have resistance and incident case. So in order to go further, Thailand set a goal to have vertical transmission rate below 1% by 2020. And we would like to do, to focus more to reduce HIV prevalence among pregnant women, increase couple HIV counseling and testing, which currently is less than 50%. We have to increase access to HIV viral load for pregnant women. So far, we have less than one third of HIV of HIV pregnant women received ART testing because it's built in, in adult care. They just need six months and if, if they get less than six months of ART during pregnancy, they don't have a chance to get HIV testing. And we need to intensification heart for both pregnant women and newborn who are at high risk. So in summary, I think elimination of HIV vertical transmission can be done and need to be done by address some challenges. The first thing is to integrate it with MCH services to reduce stigma and increase involvement in male partner. Universal HIV testing is needed in, at antenatal care for the baby and also for the overall HIV prevention effort to end HIV epidemic. Heart for all HIV pregnant women as early as possible and manage them according to the risk of transmission. We cannot do business as usual for everyone. We have to have targeted high-risk pregnant women pairs. And ongoing program monitoring and evaluation is critical for 
each country, each clinics, or each program to find out what is the still the challenges in your program and how to overcome this. And I would like to end my talk with this quote from Lynn Morfinson. She's the one who worked entire career in prevention of HIV transmission and also pediatrics ARV. When she was asked, what is the transmission rate that you accept for vertical transmission? And her simple question, simple answer is just, one child is too many. If we value the child life in this region and around the world, they are the reason that you come here today to HIV conference. You related to HIV in some way, policy maker, researchers, nurses, doctors, pharmacies, or whatever you involve. Make sure that you do more than you already do today to overcome the challenges, to make sure that every single life every newborn in this region is safe and can be born free from HIV. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Tanya Wee. So I think we have uh, uh, time left for uh, one question, a comment from the floor, please. Yes, please identify yourself, please. Yeah, okay. um, uh, I'm Dr. Nhung from Vietnam. I have two questions for you. Thank you so much for excellent presentation because we learned a lot from your presentations. So in Vietnam, you know, in, especially in Ho Chi Minh City, we have uh, some children affecting HIV because uh, their mother failed the first light therapy. So I would like to ask you for uh, ARV regimen for infant when mother failed the first light therapy, first light therapy in Vietnam TD app, blood, TTC, and affavians. So if we need only AZT, 3 tc we doubt nevirapine or not, because uh, anyhow nevirapine doesn't work. The second question, uh, in the slide you saw lopinavir can reduce the progesterone. So if the woman on second line therapy, they get pregnant, so if we switch lopinavir to atosatavir or somewhere else, no, thank you so much. A uh, first, okay. first question. Yeah, um, yeah the mic is, is not work now. The first question is that if mother have nevirapine or, in, or if are resistant, what regimen we should give to the baby? Uh, the answer is still ACT treatise nevirapine because we don't know that the virus that will transmit to the baby is the Y type or resistant. And the secondly, because the Nivirapine is the one that approved for newborn. Lopinavir cannot use before 14 days of life. And another drug that will be available is roticovir. Roticovir is the one that is have syrup formulation in newborn, but it's not available, but it can be used. And the second question is that, um, what is the second question again? A mother on second line therapy. Okay, with mother on second line, lopinavir can we, should, do we need to change to other regimen because of the risk of prematurity? It's overall risk in the boosted PI, not just lopinavir. So usually we recommend that whatever regimen that can have viral suppression, we not change. But we just be careful that they might at risk of preterm delivery. Thank you. Okay. Um, thank you very much, uh, Tanya Wee. And I would like to thank all the uh, distinguished and wonderful speaker uh, and now we we have uh, a coffee break and adjourn another return another uh, 15 minutes i guess thank you